All right, the next type of uh, pet food that we're going to be making is a chunks and gravy, or also known as a cuts and gravy style food. Uh, there's uh, two components to these products. First is to create the chunks, and then the second as a unit operation is to produce the gravy. And then as a third operation, we bring the chunks and the gravy together, we mix them, fill the can. Once the cans are filled, again, like the loaf style product, we go to the seamer, seam the cans, and then place them in the retort. To help us facilitate making these chunks, in most large factories, they will have a large unit called a steam tunnel. And that's where we're cooking the meat product and getting it to form a structure um, using steam heat. And it's sort of a tunnel, and over the top of it, we'll see uh, injection of steam it cooks with moist heat, in essence. To replicate that in our laboratory, we've assembled something akin to a steam tunnel. And Amanda has one assembled here. If you can kind of peel back one of the layers there, Amanda. In essence, what we're going to do is use a convection oven to help us generate steam. And in that steam tunnel, our experimental model here, we have water in the bottom of the hotel pan. And on top of that hotel pan, we have a cooling rack. And what we'll be doing is taking a pan where we've piped out the meat into long strips. We'll place that cookie sheet inside here on this cooling rack, and then we'll put the foil back over the top and place it in the oven. In essence, we're gonna be using steam heat generated out of the bottom of this uh, steam tunnel prototype to help us use moist heat to cook and set those chunks. All right, so Amanda's placed our steam tunnel in the oven to begin preheating so that it's ready to go once we have our meat chunks uh, ready to, to place in the uh, steam tunnel. And uh, so we're at the point now where we can start to assemble our meat chunks. We're going to create a meat batter, and that meat batter is going to include, in this case, ground chicken, water, we're going to bring water in two ways, either liquid water or in some cases we're going to try to uh, control the temperature of that moisture. And in the research lab we might use ice, in the pet food manufacturing facility we might use chilled water. Uh, included in that is a binder, in this case we're looking at porcine plasma. Uh, a number of different ingredients are used in this case, uh, porcine plasma or uh, egg whites or we might see wheat gluten used. It just depends on the, the type and style and the, the technology that's been developed by the pet food company. We'll also include a certain amount of cornstarch, salt, canola oil, and our vitamin and trace mineral premix. The chunk in this case is going to carry most of the nutrients with it, and so the, the other part of the, the mix is going to be the gravy and it's really there just as a coating or an extra fluid as part of the whole uh, can process. Okay, so our first step here is to begin the process of assembling the meat chunk. In this case, we need to be able to get some work into the meat so we can start to get some of that protein from the muscle to come out into the mix and help with the binding process. So Amanda, we're, in this case, we're going to use a food processor in a pet food factory, we might use a high shear mixer. Amanda's going to load the hopper here of the uh, food processor, and then we'll begin to start adding the rest of the ingredients. All right. Take that out of our way. Are you ready for next? I'm ready. Go for it. So the next thing she's going to add in is the uh, spray dried plasma or porcine plasma. On a label we would call that a meat byproduct or you can actually label it as uh, porcine plasma. It's very sticky. It's a great ingredient. Dogs tend to really like the flavor of it and uh, it has a lot of utility in these kinds of uh, meat products that have need for high levels of binding. Next going in will be the cornstarch. Uh, that's going to also pro provide some binding as well as uh, some texture to the meat chunk. Notice that she's layering these things in on top of the meat. 
Then Amanda will roll the salt. And why do we use salt, Dr. Aldrich? Well, it helps with a number of things in, in helping develop that meat so that we can uh, salt out some of the myosin from the muscle and, and keep it, uh, provide some, some binding capacity. And it's also a nutritional source of sodium and chloride. Then we're going to add in the vitamin premix and the trace mineral premix. Notice that we're not adding a lot of things like uh, dicalcium uh, phosphate, calcium carbonate, or some of the other macro minerals. Uh, many times what we're using here is meat products that have a little bit of bone in them, and those are providing an adequate amount of some of the calcium, phosphorus, magnesium. And so primarily what we're having to do is supplement with the vitamins and trace minerals to meet the nutrient requirements of the animal. We have canola oil, we don't want to forget that. And I think we're down to the last piece of the equation, which would be the water. Very good. So I'll let you commence to adding water and beginning the process of putting some work into this meat batter. All right. Your controls are on the other side here. Now that we've put some work into this material, you can see that it's pretty viscous and it's sticky. It doesn't want to come off to this, of the spatula. And that's exactly the consistency we're looking for. And so the next step in this is Amanda's going to help me. And we're going to fill a bag. Uh, if you want to help there, Amanda, I'll let you kind of manage the pieces there. Um, Absolutely, Dr. Aldrich. <laughs> Thank you. All right. We're going to place that into the bag. In the factory, we would actually use an extruder head, not a, a high temperature or medium temperature, medium shear extruder. It's really more of a forming machine where we would pump this material into that head of that extruder. And uh, based on what type, types of dye that we were using, uh, we would then press that material into either uh, sheets or into ribbons. In this case, we're going to uh, modify that process a little bit by using a plastic bag of ziplock, and we're going to cut one end off of this and use it as a piping bag to give us the uh, ribbon formation that we're looking for. So we're just about there. Um, looking good, Amanda. I think we've got enough in there. All right. So let's zip this off. Uh, this is the cookie sheet underneath the bag here that we're going to use as our surface for the steam tunnel. So I'm going to cut a little end off of here. So we're going to make a piping bag. Let's see if I can get my skizzers to work. Oh, there you go. Brilliant. So it's going to be a nice big uh, ribbon. And we're simply going to press this material down into the ribbon and make some ribbons here. These are going to be our chunks. So as we do this, we'll make several lanes, several ribbons. And those, once they get set in the oven, in the tunnel oven, we're going to slice them into nice uniform uh, lengths. And those will serve as our chunks. Well, here we go, a couple more. Can't go too fast or they get misshapen. They're going to be some nice big chunks. These are for big dogs, I think. Big dogs like Luker. Yeah, that's right. There we go. Making good progress here. Now, one of the things you may note here, granted I have a, a non-stick pan, but we wouldn't even need a non-stick pan. There's enough fat in this uh, formula from the chicken that we really don't need to add anything as a, as a release agent to keep the material from coming off. It should just scrape right away uh, onto our cutting board once they're completely done. All right, they're starting to spread on me, Amanda. These are going to be really nice big chunks. Okay, so Amanda had preheated our tunnel oven and uh, she's going to peel back a corner here of the aluminum foil so that I can slip this uh, cookie sheet full of our 
our piped in meat. It's going to sit in there. We're going to put the foil back on to try to keep as much of the moisture inside this hotel pan. That represents that tunnel oven where we're cooking with uh, steam. And we're going to have a moist cooking process to help get those meats then to create some structure. And they should almost be rubbery when they're done. So for purposes of this project, uh, we're going to open this. It's a standard convection oven. And Amanda's going to place it in on a tray. Uh, we'll keep it in here at about 350 degrees Fahrenheit for anywhere from 15 to 30 minutes. And we'll continue to monitor it. Uh, occasionally throughout until those meat chunks are are completely firm and then we'll bring them out and bring them uh, to the uh, chopping board and we'll cut them into strips. So while the chunks are in the oven in a steam tunnel becoming more firm and, and structured, uh, we'll prepare the gravy. The gravy is that secondary part of these chunks of gravy products. It's what gives it the moisture. We have a couple of key ingredients here. It's mostly water. And so Amanda has measured out the water already. And you'll notice that uh, these are a little bit off color. In essence, what she's done is used caramel. It's a coloring agent to give it some brown color and that will carry through. So she's just pre-mixed the caramel in with the water to help facilitate our uh, test here. Most of the gravies that we use are a starch-based gravy rather than a flour. And so with that, we have cornstarch. And as we mentioned previously, uh, we're also needing some thickness beyond what the starch will provide. And so in this formula, we were using guar gum, just like we used in a loaf product. And so uh, Amanda's going to start this by bringing the water up to temperature and begin to mix in the dry ingredients. It's a simple uh, process. Uh, all we really are doing is adding some starches and, and gelling agents or gums, thickeners. Uh, to a water base and once that's prepared and your chunks are completed then we can marry the two together before we fill the cans. What you see here is Amanda's adding the water. She's actually going to bring it up to temperature before we add these dry ingredients. Once we hit that uh, desired temperature, in this case somewhere between 75 and 80 degrees C, we're going to mix in the, the dry ingredients and continue to stir until everything's uniformly mixed and we start to get some thickness uh, into the fluid. Okay, so Amanda's now brought the water's temperature up to where we need it to be that we can start to add in the uh, dry ingredients. I'm going to start with the starch. I'm going to do that very, very briskly here. You may have to turn your water down a little bit, Amanda. It looks like you're getting ready to make a boil. We're making clumpy, lumpy gravy, just like Grandma used to make. Okay. This would be another good application for a tri blender, right, Dr. Aldrich? <laughs> Absolutely, Amanda. We should get a commission off of tri blender sales. <laughs> Okay, how's that uh, starch doing in there? Looking pretty good, Dr. Aldrich. All right, Amanda. We'll start adding the guar gum ever so gently. Make sure we don't clump up too much here. Now, the other way you can do this is to make a roux. And we would have taken a small amount of this and stirred it into another pot, gotten it into solution, and then poured it in here. Uh, there's all sorts of iterations. One of the challenges, of course, is always taking a small amount of powder and turning it into or mixing it into a liquid. Uh, it's just a uh, setup for clumping. Uh, we try to work our way through that as best we can. So man is going to continue to mix there uh, with that heat applied, and it should start to thicken here pretty soon as the starch granules start to swell. and. Uh, once they swell, that's where that thickness and viscosity comes from. The gravy that we're talking about here, though, is still thinner than the gravy you might use at home uh, on your mashed potatoes. 
We're really looking for something that's got the color and some consistency, and it'll develop more of that thickness and viscosity as it cooks alongside the chunks in the can. All right, we're back, and we've now taken the meats, this ribbons that we've restructured uh, and created form by, and pulled them out of the oven, out of our steam tunnel. And so I'm gonna open those up and set that aside here. And uh, what you'll note is that the color has changed slightly, but generally speaking, we have uh, some stability here with those materials. So they're, they're kind of rubbery and, and uh, formed so we can start to pull them up. See if I can do this without burning my fingers. That right. wouldn't be good, Dr. Alders. No, we don't need that, Amanda. All right, so we'll go after a couple of lanes here and we'll set them over here on the cutting board. They ended up spreading on me a little bit more than I would have liked. Uh, they well, probably made too big a hole in uh, my piping bag. And so the next thing is, is that Amanda is going to act like she's the guillotine at the end of the steam tunnel. And she's gonna slice these into nice little pieces about, oh, let's say a quarter of an inch thick. So I'll go ahead and start cutting. Okay, there you go, there you go. So what we're trying to do is create these restructured meat pieces. Uh, you can see that we've got some texture. If you peel them apart, they kind of start to look like they've been uh, brought back together. Okay. We're not cutting quite as clean as I would have liked. We may have shorted our... There we go. I will bring some more over. Let's see what I can do on this full ribbons. There we go. These are still pretty firm, Dr. Yeah, Eldridge. They're, good. they're nice. We did a good job today. Well, I'll give you the credit. It's your formula and uh, your fine tuning. We probably shorted ourselves just a few minutes on the uh, the grinding. A little, little lighter and they seem to not tear as bad. There you go. Alright, so nice pieces here. So that's what one would look like. Nice clean piece. They're a little tender, more tender than we probably would have liked, but you get the idea. Um, we're able to make a chunks and gravy formula here and uh, to do so for demonstration purposes. The key things coming out of all of this is that we had to make our restructured meat piece. We're using some of the same technology that would come out of the sausage and uh, the Frankfurter industry uh, using steam heat to fix and set we're using binders like plasma or white sweet gluten to give it some of that uh, structure. And then we're slicing it into the shapes that we want. These were a little more tender than we wanted, but they still are holding their shape pretty well. The next step is for us to combine the meat chunks with the gravy. Now, uh, we can do that in a number of different unit operations, but for sake of our discussion today, uh, we've already done this uh, uh, demonstration a couple of times, so we kind of have things metered out. So in short, what we're going to do is just play, place these into this gravy. Are we ready, Amanda? Ready, Dr. Aldrich. Thank you. So we'll start putting those in, and we'll gently kind of fold the meat and gravy together. We're starting to create a nice, thick mix. It is roughly 50% gravy and 50% meat, a meat chunk, and that gives us exactly what we're trying to achieve in this kind of a mix. So the next step in the process is simply to fill. We've got our mix already assembled. We'll get a couple of cans over here. I believe these are them. So now that Amanda and I have assembled the chunks in with the gravy, we'll start to fill it. 
And again, the same kind of rule applies here. We're simply trying to get up to that five to 10 millimeters from the top of the, the can. And we want to make sure that we're even parts of gravy and chunks. So that's pretty close. Very good. Now again, in a factory, this process would be going very rapidly. The filling can go anywhere from 500 to 1,000 cans per minute. Uh, we're not quite that fast. The seaming as well can be 500 to 1,000 cans per minute. They're kind of they're synchronized with each other. And they're filling generally by volume, uh, whereas uh, in this case, we're filling by volume as well, but they would be metered in through the canning uh, filler apparatus. So we have three cans there for a demonstration for a chunk of grain execution. Okay, by way of example, this is what most companies would do after they've gone through their processing, either through a test or on their daily operations, they would do a quality control check. And we typically call them a can cutting. And just for that reason, we're cutting open the cans. This is the recipe that corresponds to the loaf product that we made previously. This is the chunks and gravy, and then this is a mystery product we'll talk about in a moment. So first off, I've gone ahead and opened up the lids. You can kind of see what the product looks like from the top. It looks to make a nice gel. Uh, we'll put that in here, see if we can get it to squeeze out of the can or cooperate a little bit. And I'm gonna seal it a little bit. Amanda's probably the right direction. She's backed away because you never know what's going to come out of the can. Um, I didn't bring that across far enough. There we go. Let's see if we can get this to come out of our can for us. And that can be one of our criterion for success. Okay, there we go. Beautiful. So you can see here that it retained the shape of the, of the can. And if you look very closely here, we're seeing rice all the way through the column of the can. And so clearly the gum, this guar gum, was able to help us out. We've got a nice firm loaf. It's got a lot of resistance against the cut of the knife. When we slice down through, we get an idea of what it looks like. And there we are, success. So there's our carrots and potatoes and rice throughout the meat. We've got a nice firm texture and a nice aroma. Success, well done. Okay, so now we'll move over to the chunks and gravy formula. I'm gonna go ahead and slice that lid off. Maybe that'll keep me from slicing my hand. That wouldn't be good, Dr. Aldrich. No, we don't want any uh, lost time injuries today. So there's what the top of the chunks and gravy can looks like. Same formula that we just did. And nice presentation. Fell right out of the can very easily. And uh, we've got nice pieces with nice brown gravy. You probably wouldn't have suspected that it would have been that dry looking. Uh, it would have been more viscous or liquid. Uh, but clearly, it, the chunks soak up some of that gravy as well as some of that gravy starts to thicken. You can see here that we've got a little bit of fat that's kind of uh, crept out or cooked out. That's a problem. We need to probably think about our recipe a little bit more and possibly using some emulsifiers or more high shear uh, mixing before we go into the, the uh, cooking process. So here's what the, one of those chunks looks like. Remember they were pretty tender, but now that we've cooked them fully in the process, they have a nice even sort of mix there. Okay, nice looking product, Amanda. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Aldrich. The, the mystery product over here, some people ask, why do I have to use gums and gels in my formula? Uh, it seems like it's an added cost and there's criticism of, of that ingredient from a safety and quality standpoint. Uh, people are concerned about these additives. So this is a control product that we, we produce a little bit uh, sooner or earlier than these other products, but in the same kind of a test period. And this is a control, so it's a loaf without any uh, gums or gels. You can see here that it's a little bit more thin uh, it's not holding its structure as well. We're getting a lot of separation there. You can see that the materials didn't all come out. And so it's not holding a loaf together quite as well 
as when we had the, the gums and the gels. And you can also see that we get quite a bit of separation of the rice. It all kind of fell down to, this, to the bottom. There is some loaf texture on the bottom, and that's where it was cooked. So it all settled down there. It's very hard on the bottom. It was very, very loose on top. So you can see here that we ended up, that's what happens with all of that rice that settled to the bottom. We end up with this starchy sort of rice and potato mix at the bottom of the can. So that's why we use those gums and gels. So we can get a nice uniform stratification of the product from top to bottom as we go into the mix. So same formula, one has gums and gels and one without.